and welcome to the March 22nd, 2022 formal meeting. Spring equinox plus two days. It's nice to see that it's still light outside today and the cherry blossoms are blossoming in, in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, we are truly grateful that you are able to join us today virtually or in person. Thank you for your patience as we continue navigating the COVID situation and try to make the best decision to keep people safe. If you're here joining us on site, the council continues to take precautions to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 and maintain healthy business operations and work environments. While the masking requirements have changed, we are still balancing the safety of everyone who may join us in person and will continue to evolve as needed. From now, masks are no longer required in city facilities. However, anyone here in person to give public comment who prefers to wear a mask is welcome to do so. Feel free to remove your mask after your name has been called and you are at the microphone to address the council. We also have the overflow shelter as uh, Jennifer just mentioned. So thank you. So I'll move on to uh, item number two, which is Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. So I'm number three, A3, welcome to the public meeting rules. Welcome to everyone, as I said tonight, who's joined us tonight. If you're joining us for the public comment opportunities later on in the agenda, we are accepting your comments in person and also through WebEx. And for those whose only option is to call in, staff will be monitoring a separate telephone line. Before we begin moving through the, our agenda, I want to mention and review our rules of decorum. These are guidelines that the City Council has always had in place to help our meetings progress in its orderly, civil, efficient way so that everyone has the opportunity to voice their opinions without feeling intimidated. In order to achieve this, our rules of decorum begin from the moment you arrive in person and, or into the virtual meeting. We respect all points of view and we welcome new insights. While giving your comments, please be respectful, avoid yelling, profanity, or making racial slurs, obscene, or defamatory remarks. If you violate this rule, your line will be muted or you'll be asked to stop. If you feel that the need to use profanity or disrespectful remarks to express your point, you're welcome to email council members or call our comment line. In addition, our staff will request your name during the WebEx registration process to limit disruptions, your name cannot include a message or violate our rules of decorum. If your name doesn't meet this requirement, then our staff will make contact with you to gather this information from you. For those joining in WebEx, please monitor your chat in case we try to reach you. Isaac from our staff is helping to moderate the WebEx portion of our meeting and will be messaging with the attendees to coordinate on any questions with your registration. Staff is handling a number of tasks. Please limit messages to technical issues and minimal changes to your registration. If you'd like to send us any comments, uh, feel free to mail us at PO Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114. Email us at council.comments at slcgov.com or call us at 801-535-7654. And this brings us to item A4 which is the, the approval of the work session minute meetings of February 15th, 2022, February 16th, 2022, as well as the formal meeting minutes of May 4th, 2021, May 18th, 2021, and June 21st, 2021. I will look for a motion. Chair, I move to approve the minutes. From, do I have to give the date? Yeah. <laughs> From, what was, what was the date on them? Council member, you can uh, state as, as read. All right, thank you. I move to approve the minutes as read. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from Council member Petro, a second from Council member Pui. Uh, any discussion on this item? See no discussion on this item. I will roll call this. Council member Romano. Councilor Petro. Yes. Elder Morris. Yes. Orton. 
Yes. Pui? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes unanimously six to zero with Councilmember Fowler uh, absent at this time. We'll move on to uh, item B, which is a public hearing. And sorry, I'm going to talk a little bit more here. We will now begin our public hearing. Taylor Hill, our staff, will be calling the names of those who wish to comment. We will call names of people joining our WebEx and are in person based on the order of registration or received comment cards. Once we open the public comment, Taylor will announce three names at a time so that people can have a, some notice and be prepared to speak. When it's your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name for the people in the WebEx. She will unmute your line and you may begin. For people in person, please step up to the podium to make your comments using into the microphone. Once you begin, please state your name and the two minute timer will start. At the two minute mark, staff will announce time. When you, if you are unable to finish your comments, please send your rest of your comments via email, mail, or call our office. Our contact information is posted in the meeting rooms or in the WebEx chat. If you do not wish to speak, please either message our staff or when uh, staff states your names, please let us know you are here to listen. Our first public hearing combines uh, items B1 through B6 as one public hearing. These are grants. But before we uh, begin the comments, I'm going to turn, turn the time over to Sylvia Richards, our uh, staff policy analyst, to give a short intro. Sylvia, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The city applies for and receives grants which help to support and fund some city programs. Each grant application is reviewed and then receives a public hearing, which gives the public an opportunity to comment on them. Tonight, there are six grants. First, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grant East Downtown 200 South Mobility Hub, which would fund the design and construction of an East Downtown 200 South Mo Mobility Hub for Bus Rapid Transit and Core Route serving Front Runner, the Salt, Lakes, Salt Lake Valley and the University of Utah. Second is the Surface Transportation Program Grant, 900 West Reconstruction North Temple to 600 North, which would fund the 900 West Reconstruction uh, pro uh, Program, improve road conditions, increase vehicular movement to the North Temple Urban Center and enhance transit, pedestrian and bike access. Third is the Water Smart Water and Energy Efficiency Grant 2022 for Rose Park Golf Course Irrigation Efficiency, which would fund the landscape irrigation and indoor water conservation strategies for the Rose Park Golf Course, resulting in anticipated water savings. Fourth is the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grant 2023 to 28 Salt Lake City Bike Share Expansion West of I-15. Um, which would fund bike share stations west of I-15 as part of an effort to expand the bike share system to link commuters to regional transit and local destinations. Fifth is the Transportation Alternatives Program Grant 2024 Foothill Drive Pedestrian Bike Safety Improvements Design, which will fund a portion of the design and cost estimates to improve pedestrian and bike crossings across Foothill Drive between 13th East and Parley's Interchange. And sixth, lastly, is the Transportation and Land Use Connections 2023 Grant 1300 East University District Circulation Study, which will fund consulting fees for the 1300 East University District Circulation Study to provide corridor recommendations for 13th East and University Streets and strategies to include a new 200 South University Street Mobility Hub and designs for pedestrian bike improvements. And that's all for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sylvia. And now, uh, Isaac, we're open for the first public comment. Thank you, Council Chair. It looks like there are nine people here to speak to these items. Um, the first will be January Riggin, followed by Courtney Averett, and then Carrie Shepard. January, you are now unmuted. Hey, I'm January uh, Riggin from the Executive Director and Founder of Soap to Hope. Um, we've been on the ESG CV grant in 2020. 21, 2022, we just went for the 2022-23 grant, and we are just making sure we're on street outreach as we speak. So I'm on my phone. Um, 
We provide a street outreach building barriers and doing night. And we work with a targeted population of women being sex trafficked in our high risk, vulnerable, isolated communities. Um, and so we are just here trying to be part of the solution, see where funding's going, working with the resources, um, dealing with resources and beds being available, um, options for our community that we work with and the people suffering from homelessness and high risk areas of um, resources. So I am a I am here trying to, I've, I was outside doing outreach, so I'm not, I'm like way behind on comments right now. I didn't know I was first, so I was trying to get back in the car at this time. So it's pretty nuts here. So I just wanted to get on here and make sure, it, I didn't know if we were on the ESG part or what part we're doing. Thank you for your comments, Jan, uh, January. We're right now on these other grant parts, but not the ESG, but we'll take your comments for the ESG at this time. So I appreciate that. Okay, and next we will hear from Courtney Everett, followed by Carrie Shepard and then Rob Roke. Um, it looks like Courtney has left the meeting, so we will go to Carrie Shepard. I'm not. Oh, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carrie. I am on a different part of our route of outreach tonight. I'm sitting with Courtney right now. She had a phone call that From came Salt in. Lake County. And so we're both sitting here trying to navigate this uh meeting but um yeah we're we're in the same situation with january working for soap to hope um really hoping for this next grant to be approved so we can continue uh providing resources and navigating um different solutions for the people out here on our street outreach that two years ago i was out here myself and i see the the involvement, um, being a part of the community and being a part of the population that we were helping at one point, that I was a part of one point, helping them and um, just get to see that daily, um, that daily, every single day, you know, what, what we're bringing to the table and what this community needs and being a part of the community. Ask if I can talk on yours. And now I've got Courtney here. I'm actually wondering if they moved the ESG grant to another night. We do. No, that is tonight. That is tonight. We just do it. We're doing it later uh, this evening. That's the one that we're all looking to speak on. So I don't know if you want to move us to a later time. So we're speaking as to the right grant. They said they'd let us. Go ahead, talk Courtney. Now. Since since you're on the phone right now, go ahead and talk to us and. Uh, I'll let you talk yes. and we'll make another announcement here in a second. We understand the confusion I'm, when we use the word grant. Okay. I'm Courtney. I'm also an advocate with Soap to Hope, and I was the first employee that came on with the ESG grant, allowing me to work full time on the streets. Um, I also came from the streets of Salt Lake and changed my life a little longer ago, about 10 years ago, but the desire to give back. Soap to Hope is unique in that we bridge the gap in the nighttime. We're open around the clock pretty much. We take calls in the evening. There's no other options available at that time. And we're connecting to resources that nobody else does. We're connecting to people that no one else is reaching. And so we're really hoping to maintain that ability and continue to move forward with that. We wanted to make sure we were here tonight to make sure all of you guys understood the importance of what we're doing, but also so that our voices are heard for those that can't be here and bring their voices to the table. And that's the population we serve. Thank you, Courtney. Mr. Chair, if I could just um, pipe in and clarify, uh, obviously for those <clears throat> for those of you who've already registered and are kind of waiting online, we'll do our best to figure out who um, is here for which hearing. But um, hearing items one through six are for <clears throat> excuse me are for grants that the city has applied to, for the community to come and um, comment on grants that the city has applied for. 
Later in the evening, we have a public hearing scheduled for CDBG, HOME, HOPWA, and ESG grants that are from the federal government that the city is allocating. All of those programs will be heard at the same time, so your two minutes apply, whether it's for CDBG, ESG, HOME, HOPWA, and we'll do our best to kind of um, manage that, but we'll, we'll be patient, and we hope that you're patient as well, and um, we're here to hear everyone. And so I just wanted to make that clarification because I know it can be confusing. So, Jennifer, can I add one piece of clarity? Items B1 through 6 are heard as one hearing. Thank right. you. Right. They're heard as one hearing. So, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Taylor, back to you. All right. So, next we will hear from Rob Rook, followed by Kathy Bray, and then Jared Hafen. Rob, you're now unmuted. Hi there, thank you. Uh, I, I apologize for the confusion. My comment is about uh, CDBG, but if that's okay, I'll just uh, give that to you now. We have another representative that will that will be speaking later on too. But uh, my name is Rob Oak. I'm from uh, NeighborWork Salt Lake. Uh, we are a 45 year old nonprofit, and we have a, a great and long uh, relationship with Salt Lake City. I'm I'm really here just to to thank the uh, the mayor's office for the recommendation and the uh, the neighborhoods department that works uh, uh, closely with them. They have recommended CDBG funding for our uh, home improvement and rehabilitation program. Uh, it's just a critical need. We're looking forward of, to to being able to put those funds to use if you approve them and and work closely with the city's program and our other partners to uh, address this real critical need. Um, when you think about the the home funds, we. We were not approved for the amount requested for that night. I understand we were asking for um, a pretty significant amount of money to help address some affordable housing issues that are pretty dramatic in Salt Lake City. Uh, I think the affordability gap right now is about $100,000, uh, which is far beyond any uh, down payment program out there right now. E e even if you haven't considered us for, for this round of funding, I hope that you will uh, think of this type of innovative and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, look at this type of an approach for such a dramatic problem that we have with affordable housing in Salt Lake City. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and next we will hear from Kathy Bray, followed by Jared Hayson and then George Chapman. Kathy, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm on the telephone and I'm sorry that I can't be with you tonight. Um, but I wanted to say I'm actually speaking also to ESG, and so I apologize for selecting the wrong um, category. Um, I'm the president and CEO for Volunteers of America, and I wanted to thank the Mayor Mendenhall, certainly um, the city council members, the review committee, and the city staff for all their hard work in reviewing the applications and making favorable recommendations for the funding of two of the homeless resource centers that Volunteers of America operate in Salt Lake City. One is the Geraldine E. King Women's Resource Center on 131 East and 700 South, and that's the 200-bed Women's Resource Center that we um, operate and serve about 1,000 different women each year. We're providing for basic needs. We've been handling COVID prevention and response, plus housing case management and placements. Um, we requested funds to assist with janitorial and housekeeping. Um, last year, we helped place 169 women into community housing. And then secondly, our Youth Resource Center on 888 South and 400 West. Um, we are also requesting similar um, category of funding. We have the 30 beds there for the 16 to 22 year olds. We're uh, providing basic needs and rapid rehousing placement plus COVID support. We will be matching these funds and really appreciate the recommendation. Volunteers of America Utah has been here for 36 years and partnering the whole time with Salt Lake City and we're really grateful for that partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Now we will hear from Jared Hafen, followed by George Chapman. Zabriskie. Jared, you're now unmuted. 
Thank you. Uh, hello, council members and Mayor Mendenhall, and thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, my name is Jared Hafen. I'm the programming director with the Utah AIDS Foundation. Uh, Utah, Utah AIDS Foundation truly appreciates Salt Lake City's previous Hopwest support. Um, Utah AIDS Foundation, through client driven services, champions sexual health and overall well being for those living with or at risk for HIV and other STIs. Uh, we work to achieve a future where everyone has equitable access to HIV and STI education, prevention, treatment, and care. And Utah AIDS Foundation submitted two applications, one for housing case management and the other for our behavioral health program. Uh, so housing remains the most vital tool we have in ensuring people living with HIV remain stable in their medical care and adherent to their medications. And the support we receive allows us to provide case management to people living with HIV, who's, uh, which significantly improves their housing stability. Uh, people living with HIV are one of Utah's most vulnerable populations because of the high cost burden associated with their illness. Most of the clients experience extreme financial hardship, and many of uh, many also face additional risk factors for mental health disorders, including homelessness, being LGBTQ plus young adults, and people who are aging and living with HIV. Um, having a chronic illness or having experienced trauma, um, all of which experience significantly high rates of depression and suicide risk. Uh, so this past year, um, Utah AIDS Foundation started behavioral health program and hired a full-time clinical social worker. So we're also asking to support um, for support to provide the much needed individualized mental health counseling to people living with HIV. Uh, we appreciate your consideration for continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. And now we will hear from George Chapman, followed by Tara Zabriskie, and then Nigel Sweeby. Off. Can you hear me now? Yes, Mute can. on. Can you hear me now? Mute yes. off. Hello? We got you loud and clear, George. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm against the 200 South Transit Hub since the money approximately $400,000 should be used for something actually useful. There's no cross transit, just 200 South buses that eventually heal off to the South. Spending $400,000 on that hub will end up as a homeless day center at best. It will not decrease pollution. I'm also concerned about the 900 West proposal grant, since the 900 West project south of 200 South ended up increasing accidents, and the city had to spend a lot of money to redo 13 South to try and correct the issues. And I'm also concerned about the Foothill Drive bike pedestrian crossing this city should take a policy of do not increase pollution. But if the bike pedestrian crossing isn't done right on a very congested street, it's going to increase pollution. That'll end up in the East Bench area. And the people in the East Bench don't want more pollution. If you want safer crossings, discourage all the left-hand turns that the center turn lane on Foothill encourages. Those are my comments and thank you for listening. Thank you, George. Next, we'll hear from Tara Zabriskie and then Nigel Swaby. Tara, you're now unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm here to really listen. Um, I'm actually a registered nurse in Utah County. I'm the founder of Pomari Outpatient Treatment Center. Um, we work with people, a lot of them um, are coming from Salt Lake City or have been in Salt Lake City and homeless. Um, we provide an outpatient um, medication assisted treatment program. We also have a nonprofit, um, it's called the Little Feet Foundation that works with um, underprivileged children in our community. We're looking at having this nonprofit also have a chapter in Salt Lake City. Um, we provide education, we provide resources to schools in Utah County. Um, we've worked with two schools in the last six months and provided um, 100 shoe vouchers to children in need. Um, the main thing, I, like I said, I'm here to just really listen. Um, a lot of our clients are impacted by homelessness and they do end up in Salt Lake City. 
And so I just want to see what is available and also talk a little bit, you know, let you know what we do in Utah County as well. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Nigel Swaby, who is there in person. Evening council. <laughs> it's been two years since I've been in this room, uh, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm here to speak in favor of the uh, of these grants, particularly the uh, the construction on Ninth West between North Temple and uh, Six North. I think it's a, a key first step in recognizing the safety hazards that we have in the Fair Park and Rose Park neighborhoods, and. That includes uh, not only automobiles, but cyclists and pedestrians. On that particular stretch on Ninth West, there are rarely any uh, crosswalks and people walk through there all the time. And if we're going to encourage more pedestrian and alternate transportation um, models within the city, we need to make it safe for people to do that without a car. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And that was our last comment for this item. Thank you, Taylor. I will now look for a motion. And so, uh, I, I thought the motion was combine items one through six, B1 through B6. Hold on, I got it. Uh, council Chair, I move that the Council close the public hearing and refer to items B1 through B6 to future consent, consent agenda for action. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from Council Member Puy, a second from Council Member Petro. Uh, any discussion on this item? No discussion on this item. I will roll call it. Council Member Petro? Yes. Father Morris? Yes. Morton? Yes. Puy? Yes. Mano? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes six to zero with Councilmember Fowler absent. We will now move on to our second public hearing, item B7, regarding the rezone of approximately 2333 West North Temple Street. And before we take any comments, I will take the time over to Brian Fulmer, who's on the screen. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you mentioned, this is a public hearing for the uh, property at 2333 West North Temple. It is a, a proposal from the administration to remove the property from the airport flight path protection influence zone A. As I mentioned, the airport in is on the property and is operating as a hotel. The proposal's intent is to allow transitional housing in the hotel as part of the city's goals related to homelessness. That's my introduction. Thank you, Brian and Taylor. Open up the public comments. Looks like there are four people here to speak to this item. The first will be Carol Hollowell, followed by George Chapman, and then Tara Zabriskie. Carol, you're now unmuted. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, thank you for the support. I'm the CEO of Switchpoint and we're operating it currently. We've got um, 130 seniors and veterans who are currently living there and it has been a fantastic um, place for them to be. We've uh, had no issues there and they pay their uh, month to month right now extended stay and it's just been a really good opportunity for them to have a stable place to live. So I just wanted to Thank the city for the support so far. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Next will be George Chapman, followed by Tara Zabriskie, and then Nigel Swaby. George, you're unmuted. George. Okay, we'll circle back to George. Um, moving on to Tara Zabriskie. 
Tara, you are unmuted. I'm here to listen. Thank you. And then moving on to Nigel Swaby, who is there in person? Well, that, that was a, a short distance, a uh, short time frame. Um, I am here to uh, express some concerns about the, the process in which this was handled. Um, two years ago, the airport inn was selected as a temporary overflow shelter and uh, with no public input. Um, and I really wish that this agenda item came after the, the next one that you're going to have on the homeless text amendment. Uh, what we've seen um, in this particular instance, and it's been repeated again with the uh, Ramada Inn as an overflow shelter, is that it becomes something that is more permanent that was not originally discussed. While I think Switchpoint is a great organization and they're doing a fine job with this facility, I, I am very concerned about the process in which all of this took place. What it's done is it's continued to concentrate poverty within certain neighborhoods, which happen because of the zoning that's in the area and the the access to transit. And it, it's something that's that's deeply concerning to me. However, uh, Switchpoint has um, some things going for it in terms of the population it serves. They're not going to be putting children into schools. And so that doesn't unfairly burden the community's school system, which also has a cost to it. Um, and with that, I, I uh, reluctantly support this zone change. So thank you. Thank you, Nigel. All right, and we will go back to George Chapman and then go to Ann Charles. George, you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, Council, remember the cell tower discussion this afternoon? Zoning changes shouldn't be for just one facility. That should apply here. The airport influence zone on the other side of the airport should also be rezoned to allow housing. It is allowed by the airport, except the city doesn't zone for it, except for this one little case. Warehouse workers don't get paid enough to buy the newer, less polluting cars in this valley will soon have over 100,000 of them that drive 10 or more miles to find housing. Think of all the pollution. Don't worry about the trucks and locomotives. Worry about the 100,000 workers and their polluting cars. This city should redo the zoning maps for the area under the flight pass and provide housing for the 100,000 workers north of I-80 that shouldn't have to drive 10 or more miles to get to housing. You can't call yourself an environmentalist if you force workers to drive 10 or more miles to get to work. Those are my comments. Thanks for listening. Thank you, George. And next we'll hear from Ann Charles. Ann, you're unmuted. Thanks. I just wanted to express my support for this ordinance. I think it's a really good idea to be expanding transitional housing services. We clearly have a crisis of affordability. Just in the last year, we've seen prices for rent go up 15 to 20 percent. I know I personally am having to move because of increasing rent prices. That's putting a strain on me personally, and I know a lot of other people who are in that same position and who are on the brink of homelessness just because of the unaffordability within Salt Lake. So I think as much as we can expand affordable housing and transitional housing services, I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. And that was our last comment for this item. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you for the commenters. I will look for a motion. Council Chair, I move that the Council close the public hearing and defer action to a future Council meeting. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Petro, a second from Council Member Pui. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will roll call this. Council Member Brother Morris? Yes. Orton? Yes. Pui? Yes. Mano? Yes. Petro? Yes. 
And I'm a yes, that passes 6 to 0 with Councilmember Fowler absent. We will move to item number, I think it's B8. And the street vacation at 601 South, 900 East. And before we take any comments, I will turn the time over to Brian Fulmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to vacate the public right of way between the sidewalk and property line at 601 South, 900 East on the Southeast corner of the intersection. The property in question is a strip approximately five and a half feet wide, which runs along both sides of the parcel. If approved by the city council, the property would be sold to the homeowners at market value. No physical changes to the sidewalk or street are included in this proposal. Pedestrian and vehicular traffic on the sidewalk and streets would not be impacted if the property is vacated. So that is my introduction. Thank you, Brian. And Taylor, I'm open for public comments. Council Chair, it looks like we have four people here to speak to this item. The first will be Michael Kennedy, followed by Justin Matkin, and then Tara Zabriskie. Um, Michael is there in person to speak. Michael. Council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to speak on this tonight. Um, my wife, Amy, and I are the property owners at the uh, at 601 South, 900 East. Uh, Amy is attending virtually uh, to provide more room for citizens to be here in person. The first thing I'd like to ask the council to do is think about less property lines and um, which were modified uh, by builders' errors uh, over a century ago and think more about the plat and the design that the that those who uh, drew the plat had in mind for that neighborhood. Uh, each each plat has uh, each, each lot has a certain square footage, and uh, the current fence line represents that that square footage. Um, it's an accident of surveying and history that the fence is technically on city property, but everybody always assumed that it would that it that it was part of the lot. Um, and the planning commission that is recommending approval of this uh, this vacation um, re seemed to recognize that as as well. Um, the the um, the plat represents the vision of the of the of the neighborhoods, uh, and um, I want to dispel any concerns that members might have that this is somehow going to change the uh, the streetscape. It won't. The streetscape will actually be exactly the same uh, as, it is, as it is right now. And we have worked hard as property owners uh, in the neighborhood to create an attractive property. Um, the difference between the neighborhood when I bought the house in 2001 and now is remarkable. Our property is an anchor of that. And we made a lot of improvements. Uh, to make the neighborhood look as as good as it does. If we have to move our your fence time. time, sorry, time. Yeah. And we do have your email. We did receive your e your letter, so I appreciate that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Justin Matkin, on behalf of um, I'm an attorney that represents the Kennedys. Um, I principally want to address um, some of the concerns that we had that we observed in the briefing session that were noted in the in the report uh, from the staff report. Um, this is not kind of a, a usual situation where a property owner is attempting to expand onto the city right away. As uh, Mr. Kennedy explained, the property boundaries essentially have been shifted five and a half feet so that his um, southern so that their southern boundary is actually on top of his neighbor's house. So if you look at page two of three of the um, of the city council uh, briefing, um, it's this page here, you can actually see if you look at the red line that shows the actual um, deeded property boundary, this the south line is actually five and a half feet of where it should be, and so everything got shifted five and a half feet. So as Mr. Kennedy was explaining, everyone's always assumed that the property boundary went up to the 
kind of close to the sidewalk, which is kind of normal um, in the city. And so we kind of have this um, historical anomaly where the city's right of way actually expands into what would normally be a side yard or in a front yard. The, and the principal issue here is with the fence that's located on 600 South. Um, the front uh, 900 East is not a particular concern to anybody, but it's the wood fence that really needs to be replaced. And it would be an extreme hardship for them actually because they've improved the side yard. They actually have a pergola that goes into the city right away. And so, um, and so anyhow, we just, there's some nuances with this situation where we wanted to come and, and, and try to address um, uh, some of the reluctance we, we've saw. And I understand, as an attorney, I understand that the city doesn't want to give up right away if it doesn't need to. Um, and so anyhow, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. Um, and next we have Mr. Risky, but it looks like she's left the meeting. So we move on to Andrew Pixton and then Ray Duckworth. Andrew, you are unmuted. Uh, I will pass for the minute. Sorry. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Ray Duckworth. Ray, you are unmuted. Hi, I joined late. So you're going to have to. Remind me which topic we're on right now. <laughs> we are on item B8 Street Vacation at 601 South 900 East. Okay, I am going to pass and go to the next one. I'm waiting for something else. Sorry. All right, then we have no more commenters for this item. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you, uh, commenters. Uh, I will look for a motion. I don't want to look for a motion. <laughs> Pardon, ma'am? All right, okay, so we're moving on and um, I would, Council Chair, I would like to make a motion that to um, I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. I have a second. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Valdemoro, a second from Council Member Petro. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussions, I will roll call it. Council Member Bui. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Valdemoro. Yes. Petro. Yes. Mano. Yes. And I am a yes that passes six to zero with Council Member Fowler absent. We will move on to item number nine, which is the uh, ordinance of the Homeless Resource Center and the Homeless Shelter Text Amendment. And before we begin taking comments, I will turn the time over to Nick Tarbett, policy analyst, to give a short introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal that would amend the city's zoning ordinance pertaining to homeless resource centers and shelters. The proposal includes two parts that are being considered. The first part would prohibit homeless resource centers and homeless shelters in the city by removing those uses from the land use tables. The second part would implement a future date certain of May 2023 that the HRCs and shelters would again be allowed in the zones they are currently located unless it is repealed due to the adoption of zoning changes related to the HRCs and shelters that are currently in process. Existing homeless resource centers and shelters will still be able to operate. 
This is not meant to be a permanent prohibition, as I'd mentioned. This is the first of three planned phases to help the city establish an updated process for locating shelters and homeless resource centers. This is the first of those three components. The second would modify the conditional use standards for the homeless shelters or the homeless resource centers. And the third would distinguish between temporary overflow shelters and permanent shelters. Parts two and three will come to the council for consideration in the coming months. Thank you, Nick. Taylor, I open it up to public comments. Council Chair, it looks like we have 23 people here to speak to this item. The first will be Michelle Jarist, followed by Ann Charles and then George Chapman. Michelle, you're unmuted. Hi, um, I'm Michelle Jarest. I'm a case manager for Family Promise Salt Lake. Um, we are a homeless service provider in Salt Lake City. Um, and so I just wanna say thank you for giving me the chance to speak to you all tonight. Um, one thing I will just start by saying is I do appreciate um, that there is now like more of a timeline for this proposal. Um, and I think that that's very helpful um, and more of a comfort definitely to somebody who as somebody who works in homeless service, I think that that was helpful for me to know um, that it's the goal is for it to not be indefinite. Um, but I would just ask the council to strongly consider the message that this is sending to the community, homeless service providers, funders, and the homeless population living in our city. Um, I understand that the intent of this proposal is to allow the city time to find a more comprehensive plan for addressing homelessness. Um, however, I feel that uh, the language of you know prohibiting the expansion for homeless providers and new homeless providers does send somewhat of a discouraging and negative message. Um, and so I just, yeah, I would just like to say that, um, but I do appreciate that, you know, the intent is not indefinite, um, but I do think that uh, I would like the council to just strongly consider the message that this is sending to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And next we'll hear from Annie Charles, followed by George Chapman and then Douglas Flagler. Annie, you're now unmuted. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Annie Charles. I'm a clinical director at Odyssey House of Utah, one of the residential treatment programs. I work um, with, we have at least 40 to 50 clients here in the program, most of them coming out of homelessness. And I strongly discourage this ordinance. I'm glad you added the second half to it, which would repeal it after a year. But to me, that shows how little thought was put into this ordinance as you were proposing it. If you just changed it today, um, it seems like it's a half baked idea and it is not well thought out currently as is. So if you are to go forward with this, I would not approve this. I would look at what is your comprehensive plan before you ban new and future homeless resource centers and shelters. We just received $85 million from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan, where we can use that those funds in whatever way we deem necessary. And I think that should be used for more affordable housing, more housing vouchers, so we can expand this instead of just restricting. Right now, this plan is simply restricting more uh, homeless resource centers and shelters, and I think that is a very bad idea. Um, we're in a record high year in terms of rent and housing prices, so we're only going to see homelessness increase more. And as student loan debt is going to be un, uh, unforgiven and uncanceled right now, more people will have more expenditures. Um, and I, I don't think this is a good idea, so I don't support this ordinance. I have a few folks who are going to speak after me too. I had sent a chat. So Elizabeth B will be speaking next. Um, she's gonna come over. So if you can restart her time, um, someone will be speaking after her as well. Excuse me, council chair. Yeah, we yeah, council chair, the council staff has been moderating and keeping names of those who have registered and does have the names of those Annie has included. They're just further into the line. So if you're comfortable letting Taylor call the next people. Yes. Thank you.
All right. And next we'll hear from Lana Strathern, followed by George Chapman and then Douglas Flagger. Lana, you are unmuted. Oh, Lana, you're unmuted. Okay. Moving. Uh, moving on to George Chapman. George, you are now unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also against the homeless resource zoning change, but mainly because the language for this was not available until this morning, and the city keeps uh, rushing homeless resource center issues without respectful public comment. This city should not set a deadline date when uh, the city's ready uh, with a thorough analysis. That's the deadline date. And it shouldn't be set at some artificial time in the future. I remind the council that the previous promises to provide effective neighborhood police services around the shelter have not been fulfilled. This should be part of any new homeless resource center amendment, and police monitored video should also be part of it. I'm also concerned about whether institutional zones can be used. So the HRC ordinance needs much more analysis and not just a one-year moratorium. When it's done, it's done, and we shouldn't be having working against a deadline. This is very, very important. It doesn't need an artificial deadline. Thanks for listening. Thank you, George. Next, we will hear from Douglas Flagler followed by Tara Zapriski and then Chris Crosswhite. Douglas is in person. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Douglas Flagler. I live in the Central Ninth neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I'm happy that you guys are taking up such an important topic. And, uh, um, you know, this is a really hard uh, one, um, homeless uh, issues in our city are, are a hard thing, and uh, um, I'm, I'm in favor of the moratorium, and uh, um, I feel like our neighborhood was taken off guard over the last proposed uh, temporary overflow shelter, and we feel that our neighborhood is uh, kind of a, a, a concentration, that it's unfair that uh, we're asked to take on so many burdens of the city um, when, you know, other neighborhoods are not uh, uh, seen to, to take on these issues. Um, so we appreciate your, your efforts and, uh, and I urge you to pass this, uh, the moratorium. So thank you. Thank you, Douglas. All right, next we will hear from Chris Crosswhite followed by Peggy Hostler and then Sean Clay. Chris is in person to speak. Yes, firstly, my name is Chris Crosswhite. I'm the senior pastor and CEO of the Rescue Mission of Salt Lake. I'd like to thank the council and Mayor Mendenhall for your service. Firstly, the, um, I'm gonna read my statement so I can to stay on track. Um, the Rescue Mission is a privately funded church homeless service provider. We're an asset to the city in not only helping our homeless friends achieve their highest potential in life, but mitigating negative effects that the homeless have on the overall community. And I believe in that our goals are the same, is to help very hurting people achieve their potential and then mitigate any negative influence they may have on our greater community. Rescue Mission is opposed to this proposal to remove the permitted use and conditional uses for homeless service providers in the city. The um, Doing so would essentially stop an entire industry from meeting current needs and future needs when data from focus groups the Rescue Mission has done with our homeless friends and data from the National Alliance to End Homelessness indicates that our homeless will remain in urban settings even if 
homeless service providers do not remain in, in a urban setting or if there is a lack of homeless service providers in an urban setting. The city's moratorium started six months ago and we've not made significant progress on new codes. We welcome participating in looking at what those new codes may be, but we oppose remain, removing the current codes until those new codes are put in place. The current proposal read today would take it from 14 months from now, next May of 2023 would, the, would, would be the goal, thus essentially freezing an entire industry from providing, providing services to a very vulnerable class for 20 Fine. Thank you, Chris. And next we will hear from Peggy Hosteller, followed by Sean Clay and then Amy Hawkins. Peggy is in person to speak. Appreciate being able to address this issue of zoning. It has been with us forever, it seems. I can, I have experience with 10 years of it. And for that reason, uh, I apologize, but I'm also here to support that we postpone this some more. Uh, as we've heard so much tonight, there are so mit many important mitigating circumstances that still pre prevent a reasonable resolution of this. And so that is that. And then uh, that is there is another thing that I am aware of because I'm a retired provider and I have time to listen to all of the housing and urban development webinars and the Medicaid webinars. And we know that there are millions and millions of dollars waiting to be spent for services and, and treatment programs and so forth. So that with regard to this issue, I think if we can wait even nine months to a year, we will be not talking about resource centers and building more and big buildings, and we will be talking about smaller venues. We will be talking about the quality of services, sorry, which are not really happening now and we have to get it on board if we want the money. And I think Utah wants the money. So this idea that we have people warehoused that have been there for months, weeks, years, and no services, that has to go. And we will look differently next year this time, which will very much affect this issue. Thank you. Thank Hi. you for hearing me. Thank you, Peggy. Hear from Sean Clay, followed by Amy Hopkins, and then Nigel Swaby. Sean is in person to speak. Thank you for having me. I am Pastor Sean Clay, C. What's it? Oh, CEO with the Salt Lake City. CEO with the Salt Lake City Mission and Chaplain. Also, um, I pose this because if you look at where the homeless resources are and the homeless shelters are. They were in underdeveloped areas, and now these areas are being developed. Now there's going to be homes there. Now there's going to be apartments. Now there's going to be condos there. And so now the homeless don't fit. And as this city grows, we cannot leave behind the homeless community. You know, we need to have housing for them. And so as this happens, they're going to get pushed back out into another undeveloped area. And we're going to have to follow them in order to help them. And what happens when that area grows? Is there going to be another rezoning? You know, we need to find housing. We need affordable housing. We need to house them instead of just dislocating them. Sorry about that. Instead of dislocating them and pushing them farther and farther away. No matter how big this city gets, we're not going to be able to close our eyes to the homeless. We're not going to be able to not see them because they're there. And it's a reality. And it's a reality that no matter how big this city gets that we have to deal with because they're suffering out there. 
they're suffering. And as this city grows, again, you know, we're providing what we're calling affordable housing, but it's not affordable for everyone. And we need to have housing that is also affordable for the homeless, for the addicted, for these people, so they can get the help that they need. And so they can get also get off these streets. And that is very, I was homeless myself. So I can speak this firsthand that this is, instead of doing this, we need to get help for them. We need to allow the service providers to help them because if not, you know, we're not gonna be, if, if they move over here, what if that place over there isn't zoned right, then we're not gonna be able to move with them. And as uh, Chris Crosswhite said, you know, this is where they want to be. No matter where you, you know, zone, they're still gonna draw back here. Why? Because this is where their providers are and this is where the money is that they get. So instead of doing this, we need to help them. Time. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. Next, we will hear from Amy Hawkins, followed by Nigel Swaby, and then Jesse Hakala. Amy is in person to speak. Council members, my name is Amy J. Hawkins. I'm a constituent in Council District 5. I'm chair of the Ballpark Community Council, apparently one of those uh, underdeveloped areas, just like 700 South and State Street. I'm here to voice my community support for the ordinances amending the zoning code relating to the homeless resource centers. We strongly support the council extending Mayor Mendenhall's moratorium on the new shelters and homeless resource centers, temporarily removing them from the land use tables for the D2, D3, and CG zones. Thank you for seeing that these zones only exist in very limited areas of the city in districts two, four, and five, largely west of State Street, and that continuing to allow new shelters only in those limited zones is deeply inequitable. I'm grateful that you're considering taking the time to pause and with community input, revise zoning policies to support Salt Lake City's commitment to the scattered site model of homelessness services. I'd also like to thank council members for their comments during recent work sessions, particularly council member Alejandro Pui, who acknowledged that the concerns of neighborhoods who are bearing the impacts of homeless resource centers, he specifically mentioned the ballpark neighborhood and also district four, mostly west of state street are real, legitimate and concerning. And they are partly why I've seen families with children move out of the ballpark neighborhood. Furthermore, I'd like to echo council member Chris Wharton's comments from the work session earlier this afternoon, that year after year, the city and council have been forced to always be in reaction mode with regard to homeless services. We appreciate that the city needs to hit the pause button so we can plan to be in a better place. Homelessness and unsheltered homelessness are not going away, but Salt Lake City is and will continue to be the leader in the state of Utah in terms of shelter beds and homelessness services forward to working with the planning division to moving forward in a thoughtful way to continue to be just that. Thank you, Amen. Next, we will hear from Nigel Swaby, followed by Jesse Hakala and then Elizabeth B. Nigel is in person to speak. Thank you again, council members. This is the last time you have to hear from me tonight. Um, I would like to echo uh, Dr. Hawkins' statement about the current zoning being patently unfair. We've got seven council districts in this city, but uh, homeless resources can only be allowed in three of them. It is, it's unfair to the residents who have to support those. It's also unfair to the, to the unsheltered, to the clients of this system because they're placed in industrial areas, warehouse areas, when they should be in neighborhoods like regular people because they are regular people. Um, a few months ago, this council passed a, a resolution uh, regarding racial equity and you have before you tonight another opportunity to actually take away some of the systemic problems that have existed where we can only place the poorest with the poor communities. And I, I urge you to do that. The, the last thing that you have to consider in is the recent legislative session, HB 440 passed, which is going to take away some of the control that cities have. I think it was, I, I know that some of you council members are worried that it was targeted 
it against Salt Lake City, but I think it was targeted against some of the other cities, um, not us. We've done our part as a city. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for supporting this. Thank you, Nigel. Next, we have Jesse Hakala, followed by Elizabeth B, e, and then Shane G. Jesse, you are now unmuted. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to speak upon this issue. Um, thank you, council members. I am a substance use care coordinator for a Medicaid health care facility in the heart of downtown. Um, and not only do I work with individuals who are experiencing extreme uh, mental health issues and addiction issues, but I once too was homeless and experiencing addiction and mental health um, issues myself. So this is a problem that I see. Um, I'm, I'm very much against this because pushing out our homeless community uh, away, again, um, echoing from what the pastor said, away from their providers will have incredible uh, detriments to to them themselves as well as the community as a whole. Um, the only support and healthcare services that they receive are in the center um, of, of where the current zoning um, is located. And if I also um, understand this correctly, it would um, not allow future you know, emergency shelters from happening, which looking at last year, we had the most record breaking overdose death uh, death rates in the United States and in Utah specifically. Um, the answer is not pushing pushing away from their providers um, or disallowing future future uh, renovations and use of emergency shelters. The problem again is not going away; it's growing. Um, so again, I. Thank you for listening um, to to my opinion and from what I experience firsthand uh, and to what I now do professionally. This needs to be please vote against. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Next, we'll hear from Elizabeth B, followed by Shane G and then Kimberly P. Elizabeth, you are unmuted. Thank you for your time. I am Elizabeth and I am a client at Odyssey House. And I have actually been very fortunate in my life. I've never been homeless, but I've met so many people that have been. And my many jobs of driving throughout the city and and doing delivery jobs, I've seen so many homeless camps and I've seen them get moved so many times. And I honestly feel that if this does proceed, we're just going to see more homeless camps and we're going to have them being moved and and move around so much. I am strongly opposed to this and I really hope that y'all take consideration into what the city will look like if you do follow through. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next, we'll hear from Shane G followed by Kimberly B and then John H. Shane, you are unmuted. Shane is not currently here, but Kimberly B will speak next. Okay, we will move on to Kimberly and Kimberly, you are unmuted. Well, my name is Kimberly Bowman. I appreciate your time and consideration for my thoughts. And I personally lived in the homeless shelter and I agree with evacuating all the homeless shelters because legitimately it, I lost my desire and hope and faith to strive on my own even with all the resources and it really is uh, just a box for cigarettes and drugs and there's CPS for a reason. I support the city looking like a filthy dump for a while to get our uh, community back because bigger picture here is we're in the middle of another great depression, whether we all realize it or not. And this big funding that we got might be our nesting egg that we have for the next 20 to 50 years because we don't know but look at the metal prices and the gas prices and everything going up and the big constructions that are happening in the oil fields and those areas to where okay so we have more pollution because the workforce is uh continuing to grow which is inflating prices everywhere which is making uh demand and stress in places that are our weak link so if this is a plan to come to fruition i would like to see some of this money put towards places like 
uh, homing people that are waiting for surgeries so they can get back to the workforce to relying on our elders a little bit to take care of our children if need be or another uh, child service area and, and let us because I'm 28 years old let this age group get their life together to where we won't be able to rely on social security or anything like that and if we don't have the desire to get our own home built what are we going to rely on your home I don't think so and it, 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 I just believe in it. It's going to solve a lot of the drug problem in this state, even though it's going to look like it's going to get worse. And that's what I got to say. I'll pass the time on. Thank you, Kim. And next, we'll hear from John H. followed by Levi Woodruff and then Alana Raskin. And John, you're unmuted. John H will not be speaking today, but thank you. Okay. Moving on to Levi Woodruff. Levi, you're now unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you very much for taking my comment tonight. I would just like to speak uh, in opposition to this proposed change. I would echo the concerns um, that you have heard from providers of services to the unsheltered that uh, a moratorium on construction of new emergency shelters might very well hamper their ability to respond to future crises. We know that when COVID hit, um, the number of people experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake County went up 19% just from that. If another crisis were to happen that were to cause many more people to become unsheltered, and yet there was a law preventing the construction of new shelters, you'd be forcing people to try and survive on the streets, which would be cruel and inhumane. I would also like to submit that improving the current processes that we have does not require us hampering our service providers' ability to continue to help people who are in the most vulnerable condition. There was a Salt Lake Tribune article from February 8th that spoke of the need for shelters um, that would specifically serve people who are elderly or who have complex medical conditions, and that the temporary moratorium that was in place until April has already prevented um, them finding a location in which to build a shelter to serve people who have the greatest needs, people who are ill, people who are facing chronic illness, people who are elderly. We are, I think, looking at this from a place of a lot of misinformation and misconceptions about people who are unsheltered. I think there's a lot of fear and a lot of like erroneous beliefs that um, they're responsible for crimes or that they all use drugs, things which are not true. And we cannot make good decisions that will serve Utahns who are most vulnerable based off fear and misinformation. So I would urge you to listen to the service providers, listen to people who are or have been unsheltered. Do not put a moratorium on construction of new facilities. Instead, let's discuss how we can invest our ARPA money to build the permanent supportive housing that we need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ilana Ruskind, followed by Victoria Castaneda and then Kimberly Texeria. Alana, you're now unmuted. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great, um, my name is Ilana Raskind. I am a community member and um, I'd like to echo the sentiments of the speaker before me as well as other service providers who have spoken tonight um, to express my opposition to the proposed ordinance. I have two major concerns. Um, really, first and foremost, it appears that the mayor and the city council are choosing to use human beings as bargaining chips in their ongoing arguments with council districts, the county, and the state regarding who is, quote, responsible for our unsheltered community members. And that's what they are. They're our community members. I have no comment regarding this ongoing argument, except to say that these are real human beings with real stories real experiences and real needs who are the ones who pay the price at the end and we have to do better. Second, it's a basic tenant of program planning and service provision that viable alternatives must be in place before you remove existing services or prevent new ones from being implemented. We as a community have a crisis on our hands. I think we can all agree to that. And it appears that the city has learned nothing from Operation Rio Grande. 
Kicking the can down the road does not work. We want to know what plans are in place now to ensure that every single one of our community members has a safe place to live. And we don't need false promises, like the assurance that the other side village would be operating by this winter, which as we know, it is not. We need concrete and tangible action now. I thank you for allowing me to take the time to speak to you tonight. And I hope that we can all come to so some solutions that put human life above all else. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Next, we will hear from Victoria Castaneda, followed by Kimberly Texera, and then Andrew Pixton. Victoria, you are unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I'm Victoria Castaneda, and I am a volunteer mostly. Um, I volunteer with uh, Soap to Hope and sometimes some other organizations. And I do street outreach. And I also volunteer with my family. Um, we did some. Whoops, can you still hear me? Sorry. Yes. Can you still hear me? Someone tried to call me. Sorry. Um, we take all of our leftovers out to camps and interact with the people living in the camps frequently. Um, we have seen a huge uptick in abatements over the last year, and it is very saddening. And I want all of the leaders to know that we are watching and we don't agree with it. The people are being pushed farther and farther away from services and they cannot get to the services and they are putting out calls for help almost every day because they can't get to the hall where the lunch is served because the camps that they have set up within parameters that they could reach the camps have been abated and they've been driven farther and farther away. So now not only do they need help for shelter, but they also need help for food. They might need rides in to go to the bathroom or get a shower or go do laundry. When their camps are closer to town, they can get into the services themselves. But the way that it's going is not acceptable. We are killing people and our leaders are responsible for it and we need to do better. As many providers have said prior to me, we need to do better. This is all of our responsibility and blocking and pushing it off onto other cities is a cop out and completely unacceptable. Time. I need better, please. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And it looks like Kimberly Texera has left the meeting, so we will move on to Andrew Pixton, followed by Ray Duckworth and then Tyler Clancy. Andrew, you're now unmuted. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I work at the Volunteers of America Detox, the building that's downtown. I'm a housing and benefits case manager. I'm also a city resident. Uh, I And I live, I pass by several camps on my way to work. Um, so I'm just trying to point out that I, I live and work on the front lines. I'm in the trenches. Um, and I hear a lot of your concerns that, uh, that we can't keep putting this off onto other neighborhoods. Salt Lake City can't solve homelessness for the entire valley, for the entire state. Um, these are, I don't know, I, I get where you're coming from, but this, where do you want people to be? Because if we don't do, if we don't put shelters in these neighborhoods, then you're going to have camps in these neighborhoods where people wandering through, or you'll have camps in other neighborhoods that it's just passing the buck onto other people. Um, it's, there's no long term plan on that. We need more vision, or if not a long term plan that's going to work, then we need it to be less bad for them. They deserve better treatment. They deserve to live. Um, they deserve treatment. And, um, and uh, I just imagine you have like a jug of water where the, the container is not good enough for the water. But the water has to go somewhere. It's going to leak all over. It's going to splash all over while you're carrying it. You need to. You need a better container for the water. 
and we can't keep passing this off on other people. Um, they're going to be here one way or another. We just need to decide how that's going to be. Uh, that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Ray Duckworth, followed by Tyler Clancy, and then Bernie Hart. Ray, you are now unmuted. Hi, I'm Ray Duckworth. I'm a community member of Salt Lake City. Um, I also want to express opposition to this. Um, I want to take it one step further, though, than listening just to the resource providers that we have on here with us today. But I believe that we need to be listening to the community members that are actually experiencing unsheltered living and houselessness um, since they are the targeted community at, at, in this meeting. Um, other things that we should really be considering is um, the resources, right? They need resources. We all need resources. We're all lacking in, in one resource or another and how it's been shared in here. Why are we trying to rezone when like unsheltered people are actually living there? Um, where is the safe zone for them to turn to? Um, I don't think that any of this has been considered. And um, I also want to amplify the fact here that community members are witnessing our mayor utilize a whole group of people as bargaining chips. Um, and also just lacking that whole accountability on these are residents of, of the city, period. Um, not There's not... Um, one is better than the other. So I want to reamplify that because I don't think anybody really registered that point. Um, so I would, you know, definitely speak in opposition of this. Um, I would suggest going out there and talking with the individuals who live on the zoning area and see what resources they need in order to survive and, and utilizing that federal money that we, we keep hearing about and all of the money we keep hearing about the mayor saving for our city, but not utilizing it for resources for uh, marginalized communities or just communities that need it the most, which are our, our, <laughs> which are our unsheltered community members. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Next, we'll hear from Tyler Clancy, followed by Bernie Hart. Tyler, you are unmuted. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for being here and listening to everyone. Um, I'm in uh, here to speak this evening uh, in hopes that you can extend the moratorium. And I hope to just add a perspective and, and hope to uh, reassure us that we can we can frame this issue as um, it's important for, for all of us that are listening. The question at hand is not to ban uh, homeless shelters from Salt Lake City. It's not to ban uh, homeless individuals from Salt Lake City. And, and uh, I think what it's about is equity. As uh, brought up by many people before, the zoning as it currently stands uh, really disproportionately impacts working class families, low income families, uh, families who are living on the margins. Uh, families in our most diverse neighborhoods, many, many of whom are first generation Americans. And so the, the issues and the impacts that we're seeing, all we're talking about is making sure that um, the impact and the, co the collective impact is shared uh, throughout the city in an equitable fashion. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is that many very valid uh, concerns have been put on this call. Um, many very uh, important issues have been raised. All of those perspectives can be brought into play um, and, and will be. Um, and I think that's the point when we push back, um, you know, extend the moratorium and have these critical conversations that we need to have. But by uh, not pushing back the moratorium, really, we're just letting the status quo stand and we're letting our uh, most diverse neighborhoods, our working class families, we're letting them bear the brunt of, of the of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you for hearing me out tonight and I hope you can extend the moratorium. And last we will hear from Bernie Hart who will be giving his comments in person. Thank you. 
Thanks for having, thanks for being back. It's just so great. Uh, my name is Bernie Hart, and um, I'm in a funny position. Um, we work with the homeless, but and I'd like to. We work with a lot of cool people, but I would really like to have the system and what's being done put on pause. I'd like to. When I was here at the council meeting at the work session two weeks ago, I heard this, the council voice some doubts and some current concerns and ask some pointed questions about what was happening, what was going on, what was going what we were going to do, what was what. It was a sense of a little bit of confusion and uncertainty. Well, I think that's justified because the people in our community that are around the shelters and when the last shelters were put in place, they were promised all kinds of things and how they weren't going to impact their neighborhood and they impacted their neighborhoods. And, and it is because they, the people were promised in the city at that time, the council that was here at that time, it really didn't get around to answering the, asking the tough questions and putting the service providers on the spot as to what they were going to do and how effective their programs were. And it, they just took their word for it. And we got what we have today because the service providers, the shelters can house people, they can put people in, give them a bed, but the system itself is dependent on service providers providing programs that work, people that transition people out of homelessness. And I brought this with me tonight. It's the legislative audit. I don't know how many people have read this, and I, I figure I don't think it was too many, but it suggests that nothing is working. Or not that it's not working, it's suggesting that there's no data to support that any of the services that we're providing to the homeless and the people we care about in the community are actually helping them. I was outside, somebody mentioned detox and caller. I was sitting outside time. there about two years ago. Time. You're at time now. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave this. Okay. Thank you very much. And that was the final comment for this item. And thank you for all the commenters tonight. I appreciate the comments and the time and energy that you uh, took for uh, to come join us and and make comments tonight. So, council members, I will look for a motion. Um, council chair, um, council chair, um, thank you everybody for the comments. These are great comments. I said earlier I'm invigorated by this conversation um, to be had. I appreciate Bernie's comments um, of what he mentioned about what the promises that were made and were not kept up, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So uh, thank you for that, and I move that the council close the public hearing and adopt the ordinances. And I further move that the council approve a legislative intent urging the administration to include in the review process for parts two and three of the HRC shelter text amendment petition recommendations to promote geographic equity of HRC's shelters by expanding the zoning districts where they allow where they are allowed in the city. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Valdemoros, a second from Council Member Picho. Any uh, discussion on this item? Council Member Wharton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't want to, I really appreciate um, Bernie's comments. Um, for those of you that don't know, Bernie does um, Tai Chi with, um, or offers free Tai Chi lessons, I think twice a week. Uh, oh, four times a week. Um, to um, our unsheltered residents, along with resources and information, and he truly is a, a, um, a inspirational community member that goes out there and does this um, on his own. Um, and I had the opportunity to do that um, with him a couple times. Um, and um, I, I want, I hope that people that have called in. Um, taking the time to call in. We do very much appreciate your comments. I hope you'll also take the time to listen to the discussions that we've had leading up to tonight. I know that it seems like this is moving quickly, but this is something that we've been discussing 
in one form or another for four years since I've been on the council, but in particular, um, our last couple of council meetings. Um, and on top of that, there is a very big piece of, of state law that changed, and that's factoring into our decision as well. Um, a, a law that we didn't, it wasn't passed by us, it was passed by the state legislature, and that's also factoring into our decisions. On top of that, all of the other, um, you know, different economic forces and generations of, of policy towards homelessness that, that is, is at our feet right now. Um, the, I appreciated also the caller that called in and talked about the bucket of water. Um, what we have right now is a bucket that has a lot of holes and is not really functioning the way that it needs to. And in order for us to get to a point where we can have one that, that actually holds water, I, I do believe that we need to take this pause so that we can do better and do more later. Um, and I, I, if I didn't feel that way, if I didn't have, um, if I didn't care, I wouldn't be out there trying to, you know, learn about what the things that Bernie's doing. I wouldn't be out there meeting with our shelter providers to hear what they think. I wouldn't be talking with my friends who are social workers and who are on the front lines working with their clients. Um, and I wouldn't go out there, uh, I wouldn't go on my own um, talking to our unsheltered residents, hearing their thoughts and perspectives. Um, I truly do believe that this is, is um, the best way that we can um, get our laws and our systems in order to do more uh, and to be a better provider going forward. Uh, and if anybody has more questions about that, I hope you'll reach out to me. I hope you'll listen to um, our discussions that we've been having, and I think that it will make a, it will make a lot more sense if you understand all of that context. But I do want to thank people for calling in and sharing their thoughts. It absolutely has had um, a, a big impact on us, and um, it's the reason why I feel comfortable saying yes to the pause, but I also um, would not say that without saying we are bringing this back. This, this, there is an automatic repeal on this, and that is to put a, a, a date certain for us to do the work that we need to do and not put this off um, more and more and more um, into the future. So thank you for your comments, and thanks for letting me give another long speech. Thank you, Councilmember Wharton. Councilmember Pui. I, I, I wanted to just uh, share some thoughts. This is not an easy decision. Uh, I don't think anybody feels this is an easy decision, but I, uh, I find myself, uh, you know, I, this is one of my most important issues, and I believe that everybody that commented here feels that this is probably one of the most uh, important issues our city uh, and our country is facing. Um, and we just came back from, from the National Convention of Cities, and the whole country is talking about this. In D.C., there are tents everywhere. Um, and, you know, we have not found a solution for this. But that said, um, what I want to, uh, what, what I want our city to find is uh, an equitable distribution of these res uh, shelters. Um, and, and, you know, I remember, and I still get very angry about listening to some of the conversations that many years ago when a shelter insured house was proposed. Um, that shelter does not exist uh, these days, and it should. Um, I remember the conversations in Draper about a possible shelter. That shelter does not exist. Um, and, and I understand some of the communities, but you know, families that look like me, families that are working very hard to survive, are being impacted also. Um, and I know that I don't want to compare the suffering of people. Um, you know, all the suffering, and we're trying to, to solve all the suffering, um, but we need to get this right. We need to find equitable solutions for this issue, and it pains me. Um, but how we are distributing these resource centers and shelters is not fair. It, it isn't. Um, why I support this decision is because we are asking the administration to also look into more equitable solutions for this, because we all need to do our part. It's easier uh, sometimes to say, well, we need more of this. I agree, but why not in, in, in your neighborhood too? Um, then we all invested in making them happen and making them work better. 
Uh, it pains me that some, some people uh, have said that we're using unsheltered individuals as bargaining chips. That's not the case. This city, we, today we were, discussing, we were discussing a budget allocation for many of the organizations that talked about this. You know, monies that the city is allocating for this, for, because we believe that this is a big issue. This city has been putting their mouth, their money where their mouth is. Um, yes, might not be enough. We are all talking about this, everybody is, and it hurts that we can still not get it right. Um, and you know, I've, I'm, I'm trying my best, we all are, we're open to this. My heart is, is, is deep on this and it hurts me to see individuals in the streets, um, but we need to find a better solution and I, that's what I support this. Um, this is not a ban on shelters. This is not a, you know, a ban of any kind. Um, we need to get this right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Petro. Um, I want to amplify so much of what my fellow council members said. And I want to say to everyone that I hear you. We all have lived a collective trauma. And we have a scarcity mindset. We have lived through pandemic and earthquakes and windstorms. We now have war and hyperinflation and my dollars are going less far, your dollars are going less far. And it is really tempting to hold on to any broken pieces that we have and say, don't take them from me. I am firmly convinced that we all have in common a goal. Pastor Clay, when you said that we cannot keep pushing people around, I'm with you, I'm from District 1 and I'm worried about my people in houses and my people out of houses being pushed around with no plan. If I did not fully understand the necessity of stepping back, especially after a season of nothing but crisis after crisis after crisis, and while we have a bucket of federal money that is only coming to us once, and we have both a moral and a civic imperative to make those dollars do as much work as they can, not just today, but into the future for our constituents, I would not be supporting this. But that is what the reality is. Is it desirable? No. Do I wish there was a button that says we can keep responding to crisis after crisis after crisis and living in a crisis state and plan ahead? I do. But I know the limits on human capacity. I know the limits on our staff members. I know the limits on the compassion fatigue that our neighbors who are in houses are starting to feel. This is the best way to protect our constituents, both housed and unhoused. No one is being asked to vacate where they are right now. No one is being asked to surrender any of the activity that they do. We're being asked to pause, come together and make decisions that are palatable and in the best interest of all of us. I am never gonna tone police any of my neighbors in this city. I get that you're angry and I am ready for the tags on social media, but please understand this. There is nothing about this designed to be punitive to anyone. It is simply designed to be a moment where we reorganize, and take on a 21st century problem with a realigned set of 21st century solutions that are available to us. As Councilmember Wharton said, I am happy, even if you need someone to scream at over coffee, I'm happy to be your girl, but we're doing this in the best interest of our communities. Thank you. Any other further comments? Uh, again, I wanna thank the council Thank the mayor and thank the Salt Lake City for the engagement and uh, the compassion and the thoughtfulness that goes into this uh, issue. And it's warming that we're here discussing this and this isn't just a vacuum. Uh, it's heartbreaking that we don't have a solution. And I, I think everyone here would say, I wish I had a solution, so I would just throw it up on the table and it would be a free for all, take it and spread it around the nation, but I don't have that ticket. I will say that the city currently hosts a number of facilities for people without housing. 
And this ordinance doesn't change that. All the facilities and the services that are currently provided will stay uh, in business. They will stay with their current requirements. That doesn't change anything we're going forward. We're looking to, to reboot this and to move forward. It looks like we're taking a step backward, but we're trying to move forward in making it better f for the full community, uh, not just our most vulnerable, but the, 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 the ones that also support the most vulnerable. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's engagement. I appreciate all your work. I look out there and there's a number of providers in this audience and you guys do an incredible, incredible job. And we so appreciate that. And I think this state sees what this city does. And I think this country sees what this city does. And uh, they uh, would love to emulate us, not us. They would love to emulate you. So. With that said, uh, I appreciate you, and there's no further discussions. Council, I will call this. Council Chair. Oh, it's Council Member Mono. I always forget. Nope. No, go ahead to Council Member Mono if you'd like to provide. I'm sorry, Council Member Mono. I forget that you're on the screen. Council Member Mono. Uh, yes. Oh, that sounded like a vote. Sorry, Council Chair. Uh oh. Okay, so I'll roll call this, Councilmember Mono. Sorry, I do actually have a clarification on the motion, Council Chair. Oh. If we could confirm that the motion was to adopt ordinance, ordinances 15A and 15B with the effective dates as noted in the work session. Is that the correct path you desired, Councilmember Valdemoros? Yep, th thank you for saying that. I Oh, this has changed from what I have in my notes. So, um, should I restate my motion, Cindy? Would yes, please. Ask? Thank you. All the Cindy's? All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, I move the city council close the public hearing and adopt ordinances 15A and 15B to amend the Salt Lake City Code pursuant to petition number PLN PCM 2021-01033. And I further move that the council approve a legislative intent urging the administration to include in the review process for parts two and three of the HRC shelter text amendment petition recommendations to promote geographic equity of HRCs shelters by expanding the zoning districts where they are allowed in the city. You have a second? Second. I have a motion. I have a motion from Council Member Valdemar. It's a second from Council Member Peach Lester. We are finished with the discussions. I will roll call this Council Member Mano. Oh. Council Member Peach, I'll get back to Mano. Yes. Bella Morris? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Pui? Yes. Mono? Ye yes. And I'm a yes. That passes 6 to 0 with Councilmember Fowler uh, absent. I will move on to our last public hearing, item B10. The one year action plan for the community development block grants and other federal grant for fiscal year 22 to 23. I do know that Taylor, we list, uh, we heard public comments from another, a number of people from the community on this one. Uh, so are there, oh, I'll turn it over to Ben Lucky so he can give us a uh, quick update on this uh, ordinance. Mr. Chair, the four annual grants from HUD are one of the most significant ongoing funding sources that the city receives directly from the federal government. This year, there are 65 applications across the four different grants. Approximately $7 million is available and the applications are requesting over $11 million. The council is scheduled to hold a follow-up briefing on April 5th. The full log 
with all of the funding recommendations, the staff report, and the various attachments are all available in today's meeting packet. Thank you. And thank you, Ben. And Taylor, you can open up the public comments. Thanks, Council Chair. It looks like there are 15 more people to speak to this item. Um, the first will be Rebecca Dustin, followed by Jeannie Ashby, and then Sasha Harvey. Um, okay, Rebecca, you're now on mute. Thank you very much. I um, would like to express my thanks uh, to the council chair for inviting us to this meeting and specifically to the mayor, the city council, the review committee and city team members who worked on these recommendations um, as president and CEO of the Children's Center Utah. We are very grateful for the proposed recommendation for funding for our therapeutic preschool program. This program provides mental health treatment to infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and their families and caregivers. And we have been serving the community for nearly 60 years with this important mental health treatment. The recommended resources will support our team of specialists, providing children, their families, and caregivers um, with evidence based and trauma informed treatment. Additionally, um, the children in our program have access to clinical consultation, concurrent family and caregiver therapy, as well as psychiatric care. As you know, um, as a nation and really the world, we are experiencing an unprecedented mental health emergency, specifically among our children and youth. Um, there have been declarations by pediatricians, um, child and adolescent psychologists and psychiatrists, as well as children's hospitals, and not to mention the most recent advisory by our U.S. Surgeon General. Uh, the treatments we provide go upstream to address children's mental health needs. They change the trajectory of their lives and that of their families, giving them the skills they need to cope with their big emotions. We would just encourage your support for the recommendation, and we again want to thank you for your support of this important program. Next, we will hear from Jeannie Ashby, followed by Sasha Harvey, and then Jason Wheeler. Jeannie, you're now unmuted. In between is requesting CDBG funding from this from Salt Lake City to support our program. We're not currently recommended, but your support is critical to our mission. Our mission is to end the tragic history of vulnerable people dying on the streets of our community by providing a safe, comfortable home for those who have nowhere to go during a medical crisis. The in-between is the only facility of its kind in Utah, providing permanent housing for residents in need of end-of-life care and, and transitional housing with medical respite care for those who need a place to heal and receive treatment while dealing with a serious medical illness. Did you know that 100 people die each year on the streets of our community? Did you know that many life-saving treatments like chemotherapy and kidney dialysis are not available to someone who does not have an address? Shelters, motels, and other temporary housing solutions are struggling with capacity and don't have the expertise to provide adequate medical care and adequate support for these individuals. With a staff of 33, we offer two levels of care. 25 beds for people who can function independently but need more care than can be provided in a shelter, motel, or tent. These clients can receive home health care, chemotherapy, dialysis, wound care, and recuperate, and recuperate from serious illness or surgery. In addition to supportive housing, we also provide case management services to help them access mainstream services and a hand up to help them when they leave the in-between with better health and assistance in finding access to housing, employment, and other services. We also have 25 beds of licensed assisted living for those who are terminally ill and who need assistance with activities of daily living. 
We um, humbly request the support of the city of Salt Lake in providing services as over 60% of those who receive care at the in-between are Salt Lake City residents. I'm Next, we will hear from Sasha Harvey, followed by Jason Wheeler, and then Bryce Garner. Sasha, you're now unmuted. Good evening, City Council. My name is Sasha Harvey. I'm the Executive Director of Salt Lake Donated Dental Services. Our nonprofit dental office has begun work over 32 years ago when a local dentist um, Dr. Montgomery realized that there was a tremendous need for dental care that was not being met by private dental offices. So he created an organization that to this date offers quality, comprehensive dental treatment for those without any other access to care. We serve as a dental home to those living in poverty or experiencing homelessness by not only assisting them in restoring their oral health, but also in maintaining it. Unfortunately, throughout the last two years during the pandemic, the public health organizations that serve low income population have been devastating. The two family dental plan locations closed, Four Street Clinic temporarily lost a dentist. Out of five community health centers, only two still provide dental care, which puts a tremendous strain on the facilities like Salt Lake Donated Dental as we continue fulfilling our mission of eliminating dental pain and suffering. Um, I am hopeful that during the 22-23 fiscal year, we will see a positive change in terms of access to dental care. But I also know that it is incredibly important to support organizations that have remained one constant that people can rely on. To meet the tremendous and growing need for dental care in our neighborhood, Solid Donated Dental has respectfully requested um, a grant from the CDBG block to enable our staff and volunteers to continue providing these dental services for Salt Lake City's homeless. Um, we are so grateful to have Salt Lake City as a partner and a gracious supporter. Together, we can enhance and improve the quality of life for those who need it most. We look forward to continuing this partnership during the upcoming year. Thank you for your consideration. Next, we'll hear from Jason Wheeler, followed by Bryce Garner, and then George Chapman. Jason, you are now unmuted. Um, thank you. My name is Jason Wheeler. I'm Executive Director with Assist Community Design Center, and with the generous support of Salt Lake City and other communities throughout Salt Lake County, our organization has been strengthening neighborhoods and helping residents of our county remain in their homes since 1969 with our emergency home repair, accessibility design assistance, and community design programs. Through the strategic use of CDBG funds, our organization provides small construction grants and project coordination to perform critical repairs for households with significant financial need. These repairs include like leaking roofs and broken sewer lines, non-functioning furnaces, and they're not very glamorous, but they can often be the key difference between an individual or a family being able to stay in their home or needing to move and find some other form of accommodation. We also do accessibility modifications ranging from installations of simple grab bars uh, to ramps and full bathroom remodels, uh, which provide dignity and independence not only to those with physical disabilities, but also to aging individuals who have been dedicated contributors to their neighborhoods for decades. One by one, these small interventions improve lives, relieve stress, and provide stability for those that are housing insecure. Taken in, aggr in aggregate over the last five decades, these interventions represent nearly $20 million of investment in supporting the physical and social fabric of our community. And in just the last 20 years, our organization has completed uh, 5,700 uh, of these types of jobs in Salt Lake City alone, benefiting over 1,700 unique households. Uh, we appreciate the mayor's and council's recommendation for funding for this coming fiscal year and uh, are excited to continue to support the residents in our community. And next, we will hear from Bryce Garner, followed by George Chapman, and then Josie White. Bryce, you are now unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Bryce Garner, a NeighborWorks Salt Lake resident board member representing the Fair Park neighborhood and current board president for NeighborWorks Salt Lake. NeighborWorks Salt Lake is proud to be one of Salt Lake City's oldest partners for the use of federal funds, and we're looking forward to what we will accomplish together in the coming year. 
Regarding CDBG uh, housing, we appreciate CDCIP board and the mayor's CDBG housing recommendation of $196,837 for the NeighborWorks Salt Lake Home Rehabilitation and Improvement Grant. The need for this work continues to be great in Salt Lake, and I hope that you will agree with the recommendation. We are excited about the opportunity this will give our community members and the impact we will create in collaboration with our community partners. Regarding home funds, we appreciate the board and mayor's consideration of our application for the affordable home buy down program, even though no funding is currently recommended. With the home ownership affordability gap for most families in Salt Lake City close to 100,000, we think that this type of innovative programming will continue to be critical. I hope that if the council does not consider funding this year, that you will you will look for other solutions that address our affordability crisis on the same scale. Thank you again for your time and for the great partner Salt Lake City has been to NeighborWorks Salt Lake for the last 45 years. Next, we will hear from George Chapman, followed by Josie White, and then Christine Millermore. George, you're now unmuted. Okay. Um, in this uh, funding list, uh, you have two ADA compliant crosswalks over uh, to cost over $5 million on 13th South. That doesn't make sense because they are more complicated and unsafe due to being adjacent to a rail crossing and over a four lane road. I don't think it makes sense to spend 5 million on it right now. It'll take years to develop a safe design. A Lucy Avenue cut through is available with a faster implementation and could provide a very safe route to 300 West for less than a million dollars. That makes more sense. Um, on another issue, uh, the ADA bus stop report by UDOT shows at best a 4% increase due to many factors. So spending money on ADA bus stop amenities doesn't make sense. What does make sense is Councilwoman Petra Esler's concern about domestic violence funding because domestic violence funding would have a better success at decreasing homeless problems than just about anything else. Domestic violence is a very big driver of homelessness, and it deserves more than $50,000. What about the YWCA, which asked for around, I think around 175,000? It got nothing. The domestic violence funding from this program deserves over a million. Anything less is an insult. Thanks for listening. Next, we will hear from Josie White, followed by Christy Millermore, and then Mike Young. Josie is in person to speak. Hi, um, today I'm representing South Valley Services, which is a domestic violence shelter and service provider. My primary purpose today is to say thank you for the funding considerations, but also talk about the impact this money will have. Between our CDBG and home grant opportunities, we anticipate house housing approximately 40 households with initial housing assistance to hopefully achieve long-term housing. This money is particularly important for survivors of domestic violence because many of them, by the time they, over 90% of our clients, by the time they reach out for services, report having zero income due to economic abuse. This means that their abuser has taken control of their finances, they have no access to finances, and it is even possible that if they're earning an income, it's all going to a shared account they don't have access to. This means when a domestic violence survivor is considering leaving, they're faced with an impossible choice. They either must continue living with their abuser or face homelessness. Neither should be an option. But through funding like this and partnerships with d domestic service providers like South Valley Services, we can prevent this from being a decision at all. South Valley Services uses a domestic violence housing first program, which means we place domestic violence survivors into emergency shelter or permanent housing without any preconditions or, or barriers to entry. Um, this funding matters, and only through a concerted community effort will we be able to address homelessness among domestic violence survivors. Finally, the network for the network. 
The Network for National Domestic Violence um, did an aggregate data report and they found that each night in Utah, 146 domestic violence survivors do not get shelter or do not get housing. That's unreal. Thank you. And next we will hear from Christy Nellermore, followed by Mike Young and then Brian Dix. Christy is in person to speak. Good evening. Um, my name is Christy Nellermore. I'm the Education Program Manager at the International Rescue Committee here in Salt Lake City. On behalf of the IRC, I'd like to thank the mayor and the council for the recommendation um, for our CDBG funding for job readiness or increased job readiness for refugees and new Americans through digital skills and digital tools. Um, for the last three years, I've been running the digital inclusion program at the International Rescue Committee and I'm currently overseeing our CDPG funding, helping with resiliency through digital skill development. And it is an incredible skill. It is a skill that is the 21st century. If you want to be employed, if you want a livable wage, if you want to help your children in school, you have to have digital skills. And I know this council and then this um, and the mayor have put a lot behind digital inclusion as a standard and as a as a as a priority in this city. And I just want to say thank you for this recommendation, understanding that it is a huge gap with refugees and new Americans. Um, with the IRC, all of our new arrivals receive a computer, receive digital skills, receive a phone and a data plan, and also given um, support in accessing affordable internet, which is very hard to come by these days. Um, in addition to that, we have just received 600 Afghanis in the last four months, providing them full holistic services, including affordable housing, access to schools, immigration, healthcare, and because of the CDBG, digital inclusion skill development. And so thank you for that. Um, we hope to continue to serve this large number of Afghanis that have arrived into our city and um, anticipate an increase of refugees coming in the next couple of years. And this funding will help us improve our services, bridge the digital divide, and really help our clients have the skills they need to improve their lives, pursue their education and career goals, and maintain self-sufficiency. Thank you for listening. Next, we will hear from Mike Young, followed by Brian Diggs, and then Sean McMillan. Mike is in person to speak. Good evening. My name is Mike Young. I'm the director of the Gail Miller Resource Center here in Salt Lake City. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I am speaking on behalf of The Road Home. I just want to thank you for this opportunity to speak, uh, taking the time to review all of the applications submitted. Um, Salt Lake City has provided operating support to our organization and the people we serve for a number of years. And we are incredibly grateful for the continuous support provided by this committee, the mayor, and the housing stability staff. As you know, the Road Home operates three homeless resource centers year-round. The Men's Resource Center with 300 beds for single men in South Salt Lake. The Midville Family Resource Center with 300 beds for families and children in Midville City. And the Gail Miller Resource Center here in Salt Lake City that has 200 beds, 160 for men and 40 for women. All three of those facilities are at or very close to full capacity every single night. Um, so clearly there is a need for emergency shelter in our community. Um, I'd like to thank the City Council, the Mayor, the CDCIP Board, uh, the Housing Trust Fund Board, and the staff of Housing Stability for their continued support of the work that we do within the community to end homelessness. Uh, we could not do it without the support of everyone here, so thank you very much. Um, we look forward to partnering uh, on future funding for the Gail Miller Resource Center and our overflow program operated at St. Vincent de Paul, uh, two applications that were not recommended for funding this cycle. Uh, we do know that there is a limited amount of federal funding to support activities, and we appreciate the recommendations for the programs that were selected for funding or recommended for funding. Uh, we look forward again to partnering in the future uh, while working together in tandem with the city to support homeless services. So thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Brian Diggs, followed by Sean McMillan, and then Bailey White. Brian is in person to speak. Thank you very much. My name is Brian Diggs. I'm the executive director of Family Promise here in Salt Lake City. I want to thank the mayor and the city council for considering us and recommending us for ESG funds. You know, I have, uh, I'm a southerner, as you might be able to tell from my accent. I moved out here in 1997. I rented the largest U-Haul that you could rent, hauled a car behind it. I had my uh, then wife, my 11-month-old son, I had a dog and the cat. 
uh, and the air conditioner did not work in the cab of the truck that I was driving. It took us six days to get out here. But as I was driving along, I realized something, that not at one point did I think that I would never not have shelter on my six-day journey uh, out to Salt Lake City. Uh, I had a supportive network of family and of friends, and I think that's one of the strengths of Family Promise, is that Family Promise wants to be that supportive network for the families uh, that come uh, into our shelters. Besides our transitional housing model right here in Salt Lake City, our prevention, diversion, stabilization, hotel, motel programs that we have, I think the most unique program that we have is our rotation model. We have 12 area churches or congregations that allow us to use their buildings to house three to four homeless families at a time. And those churches take turns housing those families. We actually use volunteers, non-proselytizing volunteers from those congregations and supporting congregations. So it really is a community-based effort to address family homelessness right here in Salt Lake City. As you might imagine, because of COVID, we have had to pivot, but we're back on our feet. I'm excited to say uh, all of our programs provide case management, intensive case management, trauma-informed case management. I really believe in Salt Lake City. As I said, I have been here for 25 years now, and I believe that Family Promise and all the organizations here today provide that that kind of support, the kind of support that I had when I moved here, and frankly, the kind of support that I still have. So thank you for considering us and recommending us. Next, we will hear from Sean McMillan, followed by Bailey White, and then Andrew Pixton. Sean is in person to speak. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sean McMillan. I'm the Executive Director of First Step House. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the council, um, Mayor Mendenhall, city staff, for all of your hard work over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been a heavy lift and you've had impact and I'm grateful as a citizen. Um, with that, um, we have submitted application for three different projects um, uh, and they have been recommended by the mayor. Uh, one is for our employment preparation and placement program. This is an evidence-based uh, uh, um, supportive employment model that um, help that is time unlimited that helps individuals not just get that first job but keep the job um, the people that we serve are people who are accustomed to low-wage jobs and serial employment we want to help them overcome that um, we thank you for the recommendation uh, the second project that was recommended is the homeless resource center behavioral health treatment services project. Um, this has been incredibly impactful in helping individuals transition from homelessness into treatment services in the community, but also into housing. Um, I'm pleased to report that back on March 2nd, um, because of the hard work of our peer support specialist, an individual who had 712 unsheltered days moved into his house. Um, that's just so profoundly powerful. Uh, peer support services is another project. Um, this has been an absolutely essential service that we've been able to provide during the pandemic. It helps individuals settle, calm, and there's no one who is more effective at helping someone calm down than someone who's been through it, who's lived it. Um, so we thank the mayor for recommendations. Uh, we thank uh, the committees that, that supported uh, this whole process and uh, hope that the council will um, move this forward. Thank you. And next we will hear from Bailey White, who is in person to speak. Hi everyone, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I'm Bailey White with The Road Home. I'm the Director of Grants and Compliance. Michael already spoke a little bit about our agency, and so I just wanted to provide you guys with an update on what we've been able to do with the funds that we've received in previous years. During our current fiscal year, with the $200,000 of home funds we've received, so far we've been able to help 117 individuals in a number of households maintain their housing stability. With our prevention program, which was started with ESGCB funds through the CARES Act provided by Salt Lake City, we've been able to support 179 individuals in avoiding returning to homelessness. And during our most recent fiscal year, our housing staffing 
were able to help support 1,628 households find affordable and appropriate housing for them in the community. Salt Lake City has always been a wonderful partner. We appreciate the committee, the community boards, and the mayor's office, and the Salt Lake City Council, both as council and as the redevelopment agency, for supporting our programs. And we look forward to working with you on some more affordable housing solutions. Thank you. And that was the final commenter for this item. Thank you, Taylor. And I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I close. I, I would like to, I will move the council close the, mo the public hearing and refer the item to a future date for action. A second. Second. I have a motion from Council Mapuya, a second from Council Member Wharton. Any discussion on this item? I just wanted to say, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say thank you for all those comments and and for um, your elevator pitch, pitches. That they are all great. We're excited. I'm excited to look at this. It's always hard. It, every year is so frustrating because we want to help more and we can't because of this limited f um, funds. But with the decision that we made earlier, um, this is where like this is how we're thinking. You know, this is part of the system that we're trying to fix. And thank you for the comments and for the work that, that you do. And I'm so excited to work with you as we form a subcommittee to talk about uh, what's at task, um, to hear from you directly uh, and find a solution and, and make the best we can, we can make with what we have in hand. Um, so I appreciate um, the council members comments before and I appreciate uh, the focus that we are giving this year I think which has been um, pretty amazing so far so thank you that's all thank you if I see no further discussion I will roll call this Councilmember Valmores yes Councilmember Wharton yes Pui yes Pedro yes Mano yes and I'm a yes, that passes six to zero with council member Fowler absent. We will move on to, we move on to item, oh, potential action items. C1, the ordinance amendment to require notice for permits to work in a public way. I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I enthusiastically move that we adopt the ordinance. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Wharton, a second from Councilmember Pui. Any discussion on this item? I see no discussion on this item. I will move, I will call roll call. Councilmember Mano. I enthusiastically vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Petro. Enthusiastic yes. Paul Morris. Yes. Wharton. Also enthusiastic. It doesn't look like it or sound like it, <laughs> but it, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Councilor Pui. Yes, and and am I yes also that passes six to zero with Councilmember Fowler absent. Oh no! I'm taking a quick pause here. Right, quick. Uh, we can either press on or we can take a quick break. We can. Okay. On, please. Press on. All right. We're going to press on. So, uh, we're also a potential action item number C2, which is the ordinance budget amendment number six for fiscal year 2021 to 22. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2021 2022 <laughs> final budget of Salt Lake City, including the employment staffing documents, only for items as shown on the motion sheet. Council members do not need uh, uh, That's it, right? Second. I have a motion from Council Member Puglia, second from Council Member Wharton. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will roll call this. Council Member Wharton. Yes. Paul Morris. Yes. Petro. Yes. Mono. Yes. Pui. Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes six to zero with Council Member Fowler absent. And now I move on to item D, 
questions for the mayor from the city council. Council, before the questions, mayor, as always, appreciate your engagement with us and always being here. So thank you very much and your staff. Any questions for the mayor? Mayor, you're off the hook. I know, I know you're. <laughs> I can't say that about the, the uh, comments of the city council. <laughs> we are now at the general comment portion of our agenda for comments about general topics and items that were not scheduled for a hearing tonight. I went over the city council rules of decorum earlier and those rules apply here as well. Uh, and I'll just reiterate the fact that we need to be uh, civil and courteous and respectful in our comments. And when you, it is your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name, and for people on the WebEx, you will unmute your line and be, you may begin. For people in person, please step up to the podium to make your comments at the microphone. Once you begin, please state your name and the two-minute timer will start. At the two-minute mark, the host will announce time and your microphone will be muted. If you're unable to finish your comments, please send your rest of your comments via email, mail, or call in our office. Our contact information is posted in the meeting rooms or in the WebEx chat. If you do not wish to speak, please either message our staff or when the host states your name, please let us know that you're here to listen. Taylor, you can begin our first general comment. Thanks, Council Chair. It looks like there are six people here for general comment. The first will be Keiko Jones, followed by January Reagan, and then Cindy Cromer. Hello. Hello. Hi, Keiko, you're unmuted. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Keiko, and I always say this, but I live on the west side of Salt Lake City, and it's been a long meeting, and I'm sorry I'm keeping you two minutes longer. Um, but I really wanted to thank Mayor Mendenhall sooner for what she did during the legislature to get the state involved more on emergency homeless shelters. I really, really appreciate her. Um, on the west side, we have more than fair share of crimes, drug problems, poverty, homeless encampments, etc., compared to some other neighborhoods. But I'm here today because I wanted to express my appreciation for some people for their time, effort, and hard work to try and make our community a better place. And I don't know everyone's name, but just to name a few, and I hope it's okay to name names. Um, I want to thank our city council members, Victoria, Alejandro, and Chris, you are the best. And Weston and Josh from mayor's office, and Andrew Johnston, who started our community, you know, weekly community meetings, uh, Lieutenant Woolridge, Detective Oliver, Officers Nicholas and Whitehead, Salt Lake City Ambassadors and community members, John, Margie, Nigel, Mark. They make the West Side a special place to be. And I am really proud to be a member of such strong community. Thank you very much. And next, we will hear from January Riggin, followed by Cindy Cromer and then Nicholas Hogan. January, you're now unmuted. I did speak earlier, but I was waiting for the ESG and this general comments. I did put an email in, and we were honored to be a recipient of the ESG funds from 20. 21 to 2022 and we're up for the street outreach program and just give you insight that we do a night street outreach program um going to a lot of high risk isolated vulnerable excuse me communities. excuse me thank you did, did you already thank make you. a comment earlier today about the same subject yes yeah, yeah I, I think that just once for the evening thank you Next, we will hear from Cindy Cromer, followed by Nicholas Hogan, and then George Chapman. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's difficult in, on a night when you're meeting for so long to extend the meeting 
even a few minutes longer, but um, you will be at the public hearing for the FBUN to rezone at Western Gardens when you meet again. So I'm urging you to think about the dysfunction of this zone in the interim. This afternoon, you discussed the rezoning of a large parcel of CN zoning in Central City, known and beloved as Western Gardens, to the FBUN2. Uh, this rezoning would be a huge gift to the property owner. In return, the city would gain an increased tax base and more market rate housing. Those gains would occur at the expense of the surrounding small scale investors, otherwise known as homeowners. The FBU and two zone was developed for the West Gateway, now known as Central 9th. It was mapped comprehensively only in that area in conjunction with the FBU and one, but it was adopted citywide. Problems with the zone became evident in 2016 when Charlie Square Ventures applied for the FBU and two south of the shopping center on a block in the Central City Historic District dominated by low density residential uses. At the time, the FBU and two involved no setbacks or stepbacks, no parking requirement, no requirement for housing, no density limit, and uses which were incompatible with the surrounding low density neighborhood. A group of citizens pushed back and by tagging along with the effort to establish setbacks and stepbacks in the Sugar House Business District, we were drafting Judy Short. We were able to convince the city council to add the requirements of setbacks to the FBU and two. All of the other problems that I mentioned remain to this day. The city has never examined the relationship between form based codes and overlays, either environmental or historic overlays. As I wrote in 2016, it is inappropriate to defer to landmarks and issue I'm that is fundamentally about zoning. And next we will hear from Nicholas Hogan, followed by George Chapman and then Earl Bramhall. Nicholas, you're now unmuted. Hello, um, I'll keep this short. Um, I was just wanting to comment regarding a uh, trend that I've been seeing more on the west side, um, particularly along like uh, North Temple and Redwood Road where there's a fair amount of apartment buildings being built where there, I don't know if there's necessarily being exceptions allowed or, or what's being allowed there, but many of these buildings seem to have almost no um, outdoor space, either common or private, that's being integrated or into the design of the building. And as a result, you're ending up with almost just like a big box with a, a certain amount of windows on it. and. It just makes me a little bit concerned about what the long term um, environment would look like on that as those properties age over time. Uh, from what I can tell, um, when I look at like the rent prices on these properties, they don't seem to reflect like a, a lower rent always, even when they're market. Um, in re to reflect like that cheaper build that's being done there. And um, it, it just looks like it's being done so that they can cram in as many units on that property as possible. Um, I don't see this as much in other areas, more on the east side where the designs are different. So that's all that I have to say. Next, we will hear from George Chapman, followed by Earl Bramhall. George, you're now unmuted. Okay, um, I remind the council regarding this afternoon's discussion on compensation that lease turnover uh, was pretty high, 64 we lost last year, and that seems to imply that we're down 150. And uh, instead of looking at averages and look at police entry pay, and our police entry pay in Salt Lake City is the 10th best or worst in Salt Lake County. The top entry rate in this county is $31.06 in a uh, market that has a lot less costly housing. And our hourly start rate for officers is $26.93. So we are not the top entry rate for police officers. I urge you to remember this. Also, free February data 
indicates that free fare has increased ridership about the same as a $1 fare would, and that's not a success. Free fare does not work in Salt Lake City because of the area's inability to provide sufficient shelter to homeless since it turns transit into mobile homeless shelters. And Saturday Front Runner was significantly up in February due to families taking advantage of Disneyland-like ride. It doesn't work on weekdays. Weekends, it makes sense. So I urge free fare once a month on Front Runner. Thanks for listening and have a nice evening. And thanks again for listening. I mean, you really did pretty good tonight. Thank you. All right, and next we'll hear from Earl Bramfall, followed by Wendy Bergman. Earl is in person to speak. Earl? Oh, he's not here in person. Then we'll move on to Wendy Garvin. Wendy, you are unmuted. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. I've been talking to many of you throughout the evening. If you make this decision, it's a whole nother winter and people are going to die. And I just need you to understand that this is not academic. That's all I had to say. All right, and that was our last comment this evening. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you for the, the comments. We'll move on to uh, item E, and there is no new business, so item F is unfinished business and brings us to F1. The ordinance of special events permitting of less than 31 days. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt the ordinance amendments that will extend the maximum length of a special event permit for a park use from 20 to 31 days, provided that the mayor approves the event for a reason identifying identified in writing. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Puy, a second from Councilmember Wharton. Uh, any discussion on this item? So I'll roll call this. Councilmember Petro. Yes. Mano. Yes. Bowie. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Well, Morris. Yes. And I'm a yes. And that passes six to zero with council member Fowler absent. I'll move to item G, which is the consent agenda. And I will look for a motion. Move for approval. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from council member Wharton, a second from council member Petro. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will move for roll call. Council Member Petro. Yes. Paul Morris. Yes. Morton. Yes. Rui. Yes. Mano. Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes six to zero with Council Member Fowler absent. This concludes our formal. Sorry, I got a little excited there. This concludes our formal uh, city council meeting, and uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody, for your engagement.